Today's Crimetober video is kindly sponsored by Care Of. You can take their quiz at the link below and get your personal vitamin recommendations and use code KendallRay to get 50% off your first order at Care Of. spooky friends and welcome back to Crimetober. If you didn't catch my last two videos, this October I decided to do something different. Instead of Freak Week, I'm going to be doing true crime content that is very dark. A lot darker than what I normally cover. Last week I literally puked during the video, so that's nice. This week's is even worse, so word of caution. But anyway, I'm uploading much darker cases than I normally talk about all October, every Thursday, and then the last week of the month, I'm going to upload three videos that week. So make sure you are subscribed if you're not already. Make sure you turn on the notifications as well. YouTube, YouTube, YouTube. There was a time long ago when subscribing to someone meant their content would be served to you, but that no longer is a thing. So make sure you turn on notifications. Also, I just wanted to quickly thank you guys for all of the support over the years. I just hit 2 million subscribers, which is insane to me. I never thought I would see that number on this channel. It's incredibly surreal that that many people have chosen to click that subscribe button and it means so much to me, especially some of you who have been watching me for years. You guys have changed my life in so many ways. You have no idea. I really feel like my subscribers are a community and I'm super proud of this community. Anyway, I could go on and on, but again, thank you. Thank you for ever liking, supporting, watching one of my videos ever. I really Really, really appreciate it. But let's go ahead and jump into this case. This one is insane, okay? A lot of you probably know about this case, especially if you are across the pond. Today we're gonna to be talking about one of the most famous killer couples, Fred and Rosemary West. So this is Frederick Walter Stephen West. He was born on September 29th, 1941 at Bickerton Cottage, much Markle. Growing up, Fred had six children in his family and he was the second oldest. And Fred was his mother's favorite child. And when we talk about serial killers, there's often a pattern that they were parented pretty poorly or something traumatic happened to them in their childhood. Normally there's something you can point to and you can definitely point to a lot of things in this case. But Fred definitely had a sick and twisted relationship with both of his parents, but he loved them in many ways. He was a serious mama's boy, absolutely loved his mother. His father was named Walter Stephen West, and he was a very violent and abusive man. In fact, a lot of people think that he may have even been a killer himself, and there's a good possibility that that's true. I would describe Walter as someone who is evil, and I think that really rubbed off on Fred. Walter's first wife had died from a bee sting, but there's a lot of speculation that he actually could have killed her and just covered it up with a bee sting. And throughout his life, he was a con, he was a manipulator, he stole from people, he, like I said, got in fights, was abusive. He had this outlook on life that you are on the planet to take advantage of everyone and everything you can, and he really taught this concept to Fred. He actually specifically taught him that you can do whatever you want as long as you get away with it. And Fred really hung on to that his whole life. So one of the things that makes this case very disturbing is it involves a lot of incest, also just sexual assault in general. Walter was a very violently sexual person. He had a history of assaulting women right in front of Fred, teaching that it was okay as long as you got away with it. Walter made it pretty clear to Fred that if you don't take advantage of a woman, and you had the opportunity to do so, then you are stupid, that you are weak. And this is really sick, but Walter also encouraged Fred to participate in bestiality. When Fred was growing up, he had multiple sexual encounters with sheep, pigs, and possibly some other animals. His mother's name was Daisy, Daisy Hannah Hill. Daisy was a very old fashioned woman, very strict. According to Fred, she was really the ruler of the household, even more so than his father was. She had a lot of rules and a lot of punishments to go with those rules, and Fred's father was also very strict. So both of them really cracked down on their kids, but they still had this weird, loving relationship that went way too far. His mother was also a very sick, individual. She had a lot of sexual obsessions and 
really crossed the line with Fred several times. In fact, when he was 13 years old, he was invited to come in her bed and he lost his virginity to his mother. That is so beyond sick. And I can't imagine what that would do to you mentally. But again, he has somewhat of a good relationship with them and was a mama's boy. Fred's childhood was traumatic in many different ways, aside from all of the creepy incest stuff. He was also forced to confront the idea of death at a pretty young age. They had a pet pig, the one that he, you know, did, and they killed the pig in front of all the kids in the family. And this was said to be very scarring on Fred, but it also intrigued him. It sparked an interest in him. And the kids in his family spent a lot of time hunting for wild rabbits. And Fred was said to really enjoy killing any wild animals that he could. And because his childhood was so fucked up. Fred thought that all those things that he'd experienced, incest, sexual assault, bestiality, he grew up thinking that these things were normal and that they were somehow okay. And also the fact that he was taught to take advantage of anything and anyone that he could. So because Fred's parents were so different, but both horrible in their own ways, his mother was a lot more strict. His father could still be violent towards him, but he pretty much would let Fred do whatever the fuck he wanted. And this situation is referred to as a double bind. This is an emotionally distressing communication dilemma. It's when an individual receives two different messages that are wildly different and they begin to not know what's right and what's wrong. So essentially Fred was just raised to do whatever he wanted and take advantage of anything he could and anyone he could throughout his whole life. And he did. And if things couldn't get any worse, at age 17, Fred got a traumatic brain injury. He was riding his bike one day and got in a serious accident. And after this, Fred was never the same. And many serial killers out there have experienced traumatic brain injuries in the past. It's interesting how they can truly change your personality. I personally know someone that has experienced a traumatic brain injury and it definitely changed their personality. After this, Fred started lying more, cheating more. He was bragging a lot. He was stealing as much as he could. And two years after, after the crash, Fred was charged with raping his little 13 year old sister. However, Fred never received any type of punishment for this because his sister didn't want to testify against him. I don't know if this is because she wanted to protect him or because she was afraid of him, but either way, it's super fucked up. And this is just a perfect example of a time in Fred's life where he did something got away with it and therefore he thought all was good and wanted to do more of the same thing. It was just reinforcing that idea that if you can get away with it, you can do anything you want and there'll be no consequences. And part of what made Fred West so dangerous is he came across as a somewhat charming and charismatic person. And it's really interesting to look at the psychology of a serial killer. Honestly, I kind of want to do a video on the psychology of serial killers. Let me know if you would be interested in that. But if you look at the brain of a serial killer, it is wild. Oftentimes serial killers are very, very charismatic. They often come across as sweet, as charming, as social. And this is just some of them, not all of them, but that was Fred West. He came across as this really nice guy. He was charming, entertaining to listen to. Uh, he just was a nice dude. Before all this, there was no signs of obvious character flaws to the average person who didn't know what he was doing in his personal life. And that's what made him really, really scary. So then we need to talk about Rose West. Rosemary Pauline Letts. She was born on November 29th, 1953 in Northam, Devon, England. Her mother was named Daisy Gwendolyn Fuller. And yes, both moms are named Daisy. And Rose's mom was a very, very damaged person. She had severe depression most of her adult life. And at one point while she was pregnant with Rose, she got ECT therapy. ECT stands for electroconvulsive therapy and it's known as electroshock therapy. It's a psychiatric treatment where seizures are purposefully induced in a patient. And this is supposed to somehow provide relief from mental disorders. And what's crazy is this is still done today. It was first done in 1939, but it's really only done in very serious cases with informed consent. And it's oftentimes a last line of intervention for mania or major depressive disorder. And since they did this while Daisy was pregnant, Rose ended up having all kinds of issues. When she was a baby, there were signs that something was just not right. She would rock back and forth in her cot for 
hours and then she would bang her head repeatedly on her crib. Her mom even gave her the nickname of Dozy Rosie because she was showing signs of neurological damage. So clearly they didn't take it very seriously. She didn't get much help. She had several developmental delays and a lot of her brain was just abnormally developed. Rosie, like Fred, had brain damage and couldn't really tell right from wrong. She didn't feel things like shame, guilt, compassion. And like I said, when you look at the brain of a killer, it looks different from a normal brain. The prefrontal cortex, which is the area of the brain that distinguishes the difference between right and wrong and helps us suppress urges that we may have, looks to be less active in people who are murderers. They also react to images differently, like you can show them the most horrific images and sometimes their brains won't even react. A normal person's will light up all over the place when they see something horrific, but the brain of a killer will have almost no activity during something like that. Rosemary's father, Bill, had schizophrenia, and he also had very violent mood swings and would really take it out on his daughter. He would repeatedly abuse Rose and sexually abuse her as well. So her and Fred had that in common. During her childhood, Rose's mother's depression continued on and just got worse and worse over the years. Eventually she was at the point where she just wasn't spending any time with the family. She became super checked out and just uninvolved in her children's life, didn't seem to care what they were doing. And so Rose really turned to her father to fill that role of loving parent in her life, but in a very sick and twisted way. They had a bizarre, sexual relationship. And oftentimes she would do sexual things with her father in order to get something that she wanted. And so she learned from a young age that that's what you do in life. You use your body as a tool to get what you want. In high school, Rosie was known as a very moody person. She was really bad in school and very uninvolved in school and just hated it all around. When she was a teenager, Rose's parents did finally separate. And when she was 16, she moved in with her father permanently. As she was growing up and starting to develop into a woman, she was very fascinated by her body and she was really into walking around their house naked in front of her brother Graham. She would like to make him feel uncomfortable by prancing around completely nude or half nude. So needless to say, Rose was really messed up. She was left with unfulfilled emotional needs, hadn't experienced true love, and her idea of sex was all messed up. Okay, so now we're gonna jump back to Fred. We'll come back to Rose in a sec. So in 1962, Fred met his first wife. She was a Scottish woman named Catherine Costello, but she went by the name Rena. He actually met her because at the time he was a truck driver and she hitched a ride on his truck. Now what's really interesting is Rena was already pregnant at the time that she met Fred and the two of them ended up coming up with this plan. They agreed to say that the baby was Fred's and that she had come to England to be with Fred, her baby daddy. They also decided to get married mostly out of convenience so that she could stay in England. And then in 1963, Rena had this baby and they named her Charmaine. However, their little plan didn't work out so well because she ended up looking way different than Fred. Her father was Pakistani and Fred was English, so people figured it out pretty quick. So they decided to come up with this story that she was adopted instead. After Charmaine was born, Rena and Fred decided that they would move to Glasgow, Scotland. Once they were in Glasgow, Fred found out that Rena was actually a stripper, but he didn't really mind this. Not long after Charmaine was born, they had another daughter. This time, this was Fred's actual biological daughter, and her name is Anna Marie West. So then in 1964, Fred decided to get a job, and guess what he ended up being? Fred decided that he was gonna be an ice cream man. All of our worst nightmares, Fred West as a fucking ice cream man. So Fred was cruising around in his ice cream van, creeping on kids, who knows what else he did in his time as an ice cream man. But it was during this time that he met Anne McFall. She was a younger woman and Fred grew close with her pretty quickly. Anne McFall was also a pretty damaged person. She would tell Fred about how her mother was an alcoholic and would abuse her and she would also sell her body for drinks. So he ended up convincing her to get out of that situation and come live with him and Rose instead. He said that she could stay as long as she needed to. So she took him up on his offer and moved in. So Fred continued as an ice cream man into 1965, and one day he ended up accidentally hitting a four-year-old boy. Now this was an accident as far as we know. He killed this little boy, 
and he was in no way convicted or held responsible in any way. So just again, reinforcing that idea that you can do anything you want as long as you get away with it. In December of 1965, Fred decided that he was going to leave Glasgow, leave Rena, and take his children with him back to Much Markle. And at one point he ended up handing the two girls off to social services voluntarily because he was busy, basically. He couldn't find someone to watch them while he was at work. But this is when Anne McFall really came into the picture and the two of them became really close. Soon that developed into a relationship and within months she became pregnant. So he had a whole new little life set up, a new kind of stepmom in place of Rena. But eventually Rena crashes the party and came home. And she actually just showed up at the house didn't tell Fred that she was coming. And this was unfortunate for Fred because he had been hiding that he had a pregnant girlfriend living with him during all these months. So he decided that he had to hide Anne from her. And so Anne McFall was last seen in 1967. And Fred claimed that he just moved her to a different location so that Rena wouldn't find out about her. He said that she moved to an RV park and that she died there. He said he was actually the one who found her in her trailer along with her pimp and the body was in a suitcase. So Anne was never reported missing, but her body was eventually found or what was left of it. She was found buried at the edge of a cornfield between Much Markle and Kempley in June, 1994. And warning, this is gruesome, but her body had been dissected pretty much. Her limbs had been carefully cut off, bones were missing from her body, and her unborn child was cut from her womb. At first, Fred denied that he had anything to do with it, but later on when he was in jail, he had a visitor come and he confessed to them that he had stabbed her to death following a violent argument. But after Anne was taken care of, Fred could invite Rena back into his home. So she moved back in and a little while after living together, they decided to move again. This time they relocated to Lake House Caravan Park. And at first their relationship had improved, they were happy together, but eventually she decided to leave Fred again about a year after they got back together. And she decided to just leave her kids with Fred. Decided that he could raise them, which is very scary. She wasn't completely out of their life though. She did keep sporadic contact with them here and there. But later on, she became very concerned about her daughters. She regretted leaving and she actually wanted custody of her kids once again. She became very depressed and anxious about how they were doing and what Fred could have been doing to them. And the guilt just really got to her. So eventually she got up the courage to ask Fred who was a very scary person. I'm sure she was terrified to do this, but she decided to ask him if she could get custody of the kids. And this was the last time that Rena was ever seen. Investigators believe that she was strangled in the back of Fred's car. However, they really can't tell much because her body was not discovered until 20 years after she was killed. Her body was found in 1994. And one horrific detail is she was found with a small pipe, like metal, tubing almost, just a short piece of it. And investigators believe that she was possibly sexually assaulted with this piece of metal. Rena's body was extensively dismembered. Fred put her body into multiple bags and buried her under a cluster of trees. And like I said, she was dismembered. I mean, completely cut apart, including her head cut off. And Fred just buried her out there. And he said that he was so good at concealing a body that it didn't look like anything had been done in that area. You would have no idea that there was a person who had just been buried there. Then he gathered up all of Rena's clothes and he set them on fire to hide the evidence. And shockingly, this would actually be the 10th murder that Fred West committed. So now that Fred is clear of any women, he doesn't have Anne and he doesn't have Rena, he is on the market for a new woman. Fred first encountered Rosemary Letts in 1969, shortly after her 15th birthday. Yeah, he met her when she was 15. And the two of them actually met at a bus station. And at first Rose was really disgusted by Fred. That's one thing I haven't mentioned yet in this video. 
Fred was absolutely disgusting. This guy had absolutely no sense of hygiene whatsoever. He barely showered. He barely ever brushed his teeth. His breath was said to be just rancid. I can't even imagine. He was dirty. He was greasy. He was slimy. He was nasty inside and out. But like I said, Fred was very charming. And eventually he got Rose to be interested in him. Rose loved any attention, especially from men, because she was so broken inside from her own father and her mother too. Fred came to the bus stop every day for days to try to win over Rose. He asked her out multiple times. He was not a man to give up. He was all about getting what he wanted at the end of the day. So he asked her twice and she said no twice, but the third time was a charm and eventually Rose decided to go ahead and go on a date with Fred. And in some of their initial conversations, they were already talking about sex. And Fred found out that even though Rose hadn't yet had a boyfriend that she was a very promiscuous and sexually experienced person. He also decided that one of the ways he was gonna win her over was by getting sympathy from her. He made up a lie that his ex-wife left him and left him with both of their children. He said he longed for a wife to fill that role for the kids and that he also wanted more children with someone else. So within weeks of meeting Fred, eventually Rose was convinced by him to become their nanny. At the time she was working at a bread shop, but she really didn't like her job. So she quickly switched over to being a nanny and was happy to do so. And the two of them made an agreement that Fred would pay her enough that she could trick her parents into thinking that she was still working at the bread shop, but she really just wanted this whole nanny position to be a cover for her moving in with Fred and dating him. This went on for several months and eventually Rose started falling in love with Fred and she decided to introduce him to her family. And when her family met him, they did not approve. They got bad vibes and they thought he was way too old for her. Remember, she's 15 at this time and her parents ended up being so concerned that they actually went to social services about this. They heard rumors that Fred was involved in prostitution and they were very concerned that he had their 15 year old daughter living with him. So in response to this, Rose was actually placed in a home for troubled teenagers and Fred wasn't able to fight to keep her at his house because he was in jail at the time for 30 days for some fine. But as soon as Fred was out of jail, Rose moved right back in with him. During this time, Fred's daughters, Charmaine and Anna Marie, were in the care of social services. But as soon as Fred got out, he got them back. Rose's father made one more attempt to get Rose to not be with Fred. And in February of 1970, Rose was examined by a police surgeon and they confirmed that Rose was pregnant. She was only 15 and pregnant with Fred West's kid. Because of this, she was placed back into social services again, but she was discharged on March 6th because they came to this agreement that she was going to terminate the pregnancy and return home to her family and pretty much never talk to Fred again. But as soon as she got out, she changed her mind. She decided to keep the baby and moved in with Fred full time. So three months later, they left their house and relocated to the ground floor of a two-story house in Midland Road. And on October 17th, 1970, Rose gave birth to their first daughter together and her name was Heather Ann. Two months after this, Fred was imprisoned for theft of car tires. He ended up serving six and a half months in prison. And during this time, Rose was 17 years old. She just turned 17 and was stuck with three daughters by herself while her husband is in jail. Now I'd like to say that she tried to be the best mother that she could, but that was not the case. She became extremely abusive of the three children. This was mostly focused on Anna and Charmaine since they were not her children. She gave them verbal abuse, criticism. She beat them. And apparently Charmaine didn't show any sign of being upset by this, she wouldn't cry. She wouldn't really have much of a reaction to anything that Rose was doing to her. And this would only make Rose more mad and try to hurt her more. Hospital records actually show that Charmaine received a really bad ankle injury. It was like a puncture wound. This was in March of 1971. But Rose just told the people at the hospital that this was just a household incident. But it's very unlikely. And over time, Rose's hatred for Charmaine just grew and grew. Fred's release date from prison was supposed to be June 24th. And on June 15th, Rose took the girls to go visit him. And this would be the last time that Fred would see Charmaine. Sometime shortly after they visited him in prison, Charmaine was killed by Rose. And Rose just went ahead and threw her body in their coal cellar. 
until Fred was out of prison and able to take care of it. And it's not like Fred came home and was upset. I mean, he's a sicko. He was like, whatever, I don't really care. It's, she's not my daughter. And so he ended up burying her in their backyard, close to their back door. And just like his other victims, bones were found missing from her remains when she was finally discovered. And it is believed that Fred liked to keep bones as trophies. And the sickest thing about Fred that always gets me, probably the thing I'll always remember about this case, is that Fred was really into kneecaps. He took pretty much every victim's kneecap and he liked to keep them in his house. But also her fingers, her wrist, her toe was missing. He liked small bones. And around this time, they decided to move again, very close by this time, to 25 Cromwell Street. And this is a very famous house. Shortly after giving birth to their second daughter, Rose decided to become a prostitute and she would advertise her services in a local magazine. And she kind of transformed their upstairs room into this kind of sex room where she could have her clients come. And it seemed like Rose really preferred to have sex with women. And she liked to be very brutal to her partners and gradually get worse and worse as it went on. If they expressed any pain or fear or resisted in any way, this would excite her more. She was known for asking, are you woman enough to take it. Now, Fred wasn't left out of this. He was often invited to be part of threesomes with Rose and her clients. And eventually Fred got to the point where all he wanted was very rough and violent sexual encounters. He didn't want anything that was considered vanilla. The two of them were both really into this. They had a large collection of bondage and really bonded over it. They bonded over the bondage. But they even used devices to restrain people, chains, whips, the whole works. So the room that Rose would use for her work was called Rose's Room. And what's absolutely sick, if this story can get any sicker, is they put holes into the walls of the room so that Fred could secretly watch into Rose's room when she was with her clients without them knowing, which is very, very illegal. Not only that, he even installed a baby monitor in the room so that he could listen to what Rose was doing in that room at any time, wherever he was in the house. This room even had a private bar in it and there was a red light installed outside of the door so that everyone in the house would know not to bother Rose when she was in there busy. Now, like we talked about, Rose's father, Bill, was protective of Rose in a way and did not want her to be with Fred. However, he was fine being with his daughter himself. He became one of her clients. He would visit her quite often and they would have sex. So Rose's sense of relationships are just beyond fucked up. And in her life, Rose had quite a few children. By 1983, she had eight children and it is thought that at least three of them are not Fred's children. They're most likely her clients or possibly even her father's. However, this didn't really bother Fred and he gladly accepted those children as his own. Now, as you can imagine, Fred and Rose were not good parents to these eight children. Rose and Fred ended up being very, very strict on their children to the point where they were controlling everything they did. They didn't even want them to socialize or go out in public ever without them there. They had to follow strict guidelines. They had to do chores from age seven, which isn't, you know, that abnormal, but they did quite a bit of chores. And if they didn't follow the rules or they messed up in any way, they were given severe punishments that were almost always physical. And between 1972 and 1992, the West children were admitted to the accident and emergency department of local hospitals at least 31 times. And all of these injuries were explained as normal household accidents. By 1992, Fred and Rose ended up having 11 children in what they called their family of love, even though two of them had already been killed. However, around 1992, there were a lot of rumors going around and allegations that Fred had been raping his children. And because of this, police ended up raiding his house. When they did, they found out about Rose's prostitution services, that she was going in this magazine under the name Mandy. And there was also a big collection of adult tapes, some of them that featured children and people being tortured. And at one point, Fred had even filmed the rape of his daughter. So police decided to take five of their children away, only five of them. So Heather was their oldest daughter together, the first daughter that Rose had. And she disappeared from the house in 1986. And this wasn't known for a long time, but the reason that they figured this out is Fred would actually make jokes to the other kids in the family 
about how their older sister was buried under their back porch and that if they didn't behave, they would end up dead and buried under the patio just like her. Investigators believe that this statement was probably true, that it wasn't just some family joke. And it took them about 18 months to gather enough evidence to go ahead and dig up the backyard and find Heather. But they finally did on February 23rd, 1994, when everything started to unravel for Fred and Rose. They finally were able to bring a search warrant to 25 Cromwell Street to Fred and Rose. And when they did, Rose was the one who answered the door. And it said that when she saw the search warrant, she screamed, get Fred. So she knew at that point that they were pretty fucked. In the heart of Gloucester, one three-story terraced home has become the focal point of the city's biggest ever criminal investigation. The secrets of number 25 Cromwell Street were about to be revealed. And when police first got there, they started asking Rose about where Heather was. And Rose started getting extremely defensive and aggressive with them, like screaming at them, like, I don't bloody know, I don't fucking remember. It was years ago. She even said, who do you think I am? A bloody computer? Which makes no sense because this is her firstborn daughter. You think you would remember the details surrounding her disappearance. So they ended up not searching that day, but the next day, Fred actually went down to the police department to kind of make fun of them. He made fun of them for believing the family joke about Heather being buried under the patio, basically saying that they were idiots for believing that that was actually true. But the next day, February 25th, the police decided to go ahead and dig up the patio. In the early morning hours of February 25th, Fred went up to his oldest son who was getting ready for work and told him, look son, I really fucked up. He said, look after mom and sell the house when I'm gone. And then he told him, I've done something really bad and I want you to go to the papers and make as much money as you can off of it. And shortly after this, the police returned to the house and they were ready to dig. And surprisingly, as soon as they showed up, Fred actually indicated that he wanted to be arrested. He said he needed to be held accountable for Heather's murder after all. So he was taken to the police station to provide a full confession and then he was arrested. He formally admitted that he did kill Heather. He said that he had killed her in a fit of rage by strangling her. And it was kind of an impulsive thing that he didn't really plan out. And then he dismembered her body with a serrated knife that he normally used for cutting meats. Absolutely sick. He stored her remains in a trash can until he was able to find time to dig her grave. And at this time, Fred was insistent that Rose had nothing to do with the murder. So eventually Fred's lawyer came to the police station. And at this point, Fred was telling the police all the gory, horrible details about Heather's murder. So now it was time for them to locate Heather's remains and prove this story true. But three days after searching the property, they were still unable to find Heather's remains. And at that point, Fred kind of was like, hmm. And he started to change his story. Also, police had given him some Valium, which will make you start changing your story a little bit. But he started telling them how Heather was probably alive and well. She's probably fine. He said that she actually worked for the drug cartel and that she might be in Bahrain. And he said, whether you believe that or not is up to you guys. And Fred started to go with this for a little while, but it didn't last long because on February 26th, they did find a bone of a female in the backyard. It was a female femur bone. And as soon as they told him about this, he said, oh yeah, yeah, that's Heather. I killed my daughter. So after they found Heather's body, they thought maybe Rose was in danger. They didn't realize how violent, terrible she was. So they put her into a safe house and they started recording everything that she said within this house. She talks about being furious with Fred. However, if you listen to it, it doesn't really sound like she's in complete shock. Oh, I'm 2 hours after the remains were found there was another gruesome discovery they pulled out a couple more femur bones and soon they had 3 which means that there was more than one person buried in that yard. So they gave Fred the opportunity to explain this bone and who it belonged to. And this is when he confessed to another murder, an 18 year old woman named Shirley Robinson. Shirley Robinson was a woman that Fred had an affair with in 1978 and he got her pregnant. Again, he ended up strangling Shirley in a fit of rage, dismembered her and then buried her in the backyard. And at this time she was eight 
months pregnant, so very sad. So by the end of that night on February 26th, Fred had confessed to two murders. Then he had a cigarette break, and during that cigarette break, he was talking to his lawyer, and this is when he confessed to a third murder. And this time he ended up taking investigators to the yard and showed exactly where he ended up burying Shirley's mate. So over time, they continued to press Fred for any more information. They felt like there were probably some more murders that he had committed. And at first he really committed to his story and said there was only those three, but eventually on March 4th, he caved. And he finally said, there's a fucking load more. So after this, this search became find as many bodies in this yard as you can. They had no idea how many people were buried back there. And by March 9th, only five days later, they had dug up nine bodies total. So now they know that Fred was a serial killer. Fred was only able to identify three of the bodies, which he likely could have done more, but he didn't really want to help them out. So it was up to the police to identify the rest of the bodies on their own. And eventually they were able to identify all of them. So at first they were going off of what Fred said that he you know, just had snapped, it was a spur of the moment type of killing, but eventually they found evidence that showed otherwise. They found a bunch of stuff in the house, including a long knife, belts and underwear that were tied in a way that could restrain somebody, and lots of sticky adhesive tape that had been formed into some type of weird mask. Several of the bodies had tape around their heads, and one of them even had tubes going up their nose. This shows that the people were tortured before this happened. And if it was just something in a fit of rage, you wouldn't spend time torturing people and carefully think this out. This was starting to look like a deranged serial killer. And police had a feeling that there were even more bodies to be dug up. And so they came up with a plan to get Fred to tell them where the rest of them were. Fred had talked a lot about how guilty he felt about everything. He said that the spirits of the dead that he had killed haunted him in his life all the time, especially because they were in his fucking backyard. He talked about how his victims would communicate with him even after they were gone. The police told him that the spirits of the dead that they had already removed from the yard were removed with the bodies, but the spirits of those who were left were still there and could still haunt him. And they tried to kind of guilt him and scare him. And so they kind of played it up. Like they were really impressed that he could, you know, talk to these spirits. And they said that, you know, it would be awesome if you could come out and try to communicate with the spirits and help us find their bodies. And so they gave him a can of red spray paint and he walks out there and he's looking at the ground, communicating with the spirits. And then he goes ahead and marks where the bodies were with red spray paint. And sure enough, the final ninth body was underneath that red X. It took them 11 days to find all nine bodies. And it was very traumatic for everyone in the area, for the whole team. It was just horrific. So let's go over the victims. Heather West, Allison Chambers, and Shirley Robinson were found in the back garden of the house. Linda Gow was found underneath the floor in the bathroom. On the opposite side of the house, under the concrete in the cellar, Therese Seigenthaler, Lucy Partington, Juanita Mott, Shirley Hubbard, and last but not least, Carol Cooper were found. Once police had dug up the remains, they looked for any patterns in the way that they had been killed. And it didn't take long for them to realize that the majority of these people had missing kneecaps, missing hands, and missing feet. In fact, there were over 270 bones missing from all of them. And eight out of the nine bodies were buried with some type of bondage. And six out of the nine did not have their kneecaps. And after 55 days of digging, on June 7th, 1994, they found the body of Ann McFall. She was the only one that was not buried in the yard that we know of. Her body was actually the 12th and final body that was found. So you may be wondering how involved was Rose in all of this and does she get away with it? Fred at this point is telling investigators that she had nothing to do with this. It was all him. But investigators really suspected otherwise. And on April 20th, 1994, Rose was arrested. Initially, this was just related to the rape of an 11 year old girl and the physical assault of an eight year old boy back from the 1970s. She was taken to Puckle Church Prison to be held in the maximum security wing. During this time, she was questioned about the murders and particularly those of her daughter and Linda Gow. And on April 25th, she was formally charged with Linda's murder. By May 6th, Fred and Rose were jointly charged with five counts of murder. And as soon as Rose was given her charge, she replied by simply saying, 
I'm innocent. So on June 30th, 1994, Fred and Rose were brought before the court. Fred was charged with 11 murders and Rose was charged with nine. And this was the first time that the couple had seen each other since Fred's arrest. And Fred was very happy to see Rose. And at one point he even reached out and put his hand on her shoulder, but Rose actually winced and shugged him off. And it's really unknown whether she was acting this way because she didn't want to you know, go down with him or if she was actually mad at him and no longer loved him. Maybe she was mad at him all along and just mad that they finally got caught or who knows, but publicly she wanted nothing to do with him. After this, Fred was also charged with the murder of Anne McFall and whether Rose was putting on an act that she didn't like Fred anymore, this really got to Fred and it made him very depressed in jail. While he was in prison, she also refused to respond to any letters that he sent her and reports were leaking to the press that Rose was very mad that she felt like Fred had taken everything from her, that she was a grieving mother who was now in jail, that she had lost her daughter and her stepdaughter and she was abused by her husband, just making herself the victim. Fred begged his remaining children to go visit Rose in jail and tell her how sorry he was and how much he loved her, but Rose wanted nothing to do with him and gave this no acknowledgement. And this actually pissed Fred off a lot. He ended up withdrawing his previous confession, saying that he was the one to do everything. Now his story had changed again, and this time he said Rose was involved. So he went, and Rose told me where the, the ones in the basement was. I said to Rose, I said, well, fuck me, they ain't done bad at it. I said, that's fucking, you know, you're gonna, I've got a fucking enough here, aren't you? She said, and Charmaine. I said, what, Charmaine? I said, hang on a fucking minute, where's Charmaine? She said, um, Charmaine's buried in the, in the coal cellar in Midland Road. Yeah, she's buried in the corner, she said. I said, she's not fucking cut up. I mean, you haven't cut a fucking child up, for God's sake. You know what I mean? That was the feelings coming to me. Oh no, she said. Oh no, she's not cut up, she said. She's fully clothed, wrapped in blankets and, and buried. Rose lied to me, which hurt me as well, about Charmaine. She said that Charmaine was an accident or something. She grabbed her or something by the throat or something and killed her. I can't exactly what she did say about Heather, uh, Charmaine. She said she killed her and, and buried her in the, in the basement and at the back of the house. He ended up accusing his wife of all of the murders except for Anne McFall and for Rena. He actually said that Anne McFall wasn't his fault either and that Rena had killed Anne. Fred became so depressed, he was delusional. He didn't really know what was going on and was telling them whatever he could grasping at strings, and unfortunately, he would never even make it to trial because on January 1st, 1995, Fred actually hanged himself in jail using some sheets and a laundry tag. And he left a suicide note, and at the bottom of it, there was a little picture of a gravestone, and on the gravestone, he wrote the words, in loving memory, Fred West, Rose West, rest in peace where no shadow falls. In perfect peace, he waits for Rose, his wife. So even after all that, he still loved her. So in the end, he was a coward. He was never truly punished for what he did. But Rose was, and she did go to trial. The trial was seven weeks, and after that seven weeks, the jury came to their conclusion, and they ended up finding Rose guilty of all 10 counts of murder. Rose was sentenced to life in prison, and the judge made it clear that she should never be paroled. And although she spent the rest of her life in prison, she always claims that she is innocent. So after all of this, in 1994, the kids that were left, that were still alive from their family, were given new identities and help kind of readjusting back to the world. In March of 1996, Rose announced her intentions to appeal her sentence, but this appeal was rejected by Lord Chief Justice Taylor, who concluded that Rose had received a fair trial and efficient legal representation, so there was absolutely no need to redo this trial. And in July of 1997, the Homeland Secretary Jack Straw subjected Rose to a whole life tariff, which means she would always be denied of parole if it ever came down to it. In October of 2000, Rose actually announced that she would appeal that sentence once again. But in September 2001, she announced that she was withdrawing this appeal because she decided that she would never really feel free even if she was freed. And to this day, Rose is still alive and she claims that she had nothing to do with the murders. So I guess we'll never fully know what happened on 25 Cromwell Street, but it was not 
good. Over time, as they have gone through that house, it was discovered that there were some of those bones, including the kneecaps in the walls. This case is just absolutely sickening, but has really fascinated a lot of people in England for years. And this was a huge trial. I mean, everyone was very into it. It was definitely one of the most notorious trials of this century. Personally, I think Rose was very involved in it. I think if anything, Rose kind of ran that house and Fred was like her accomplice. Maybe he assisted her in a lot of it, but I wonder if she really directed most of the killings or maybe it was split more evenly and they each did some or did they work together on every single death? I really want to know what you guys think. So be sure to leave me a comment and let me know what you think about the case overall and how involved do you think Rose actually was? I will be back next Thursday for another Crime Tober video, another dark one. But before I go, I wanted to tell you a little bit more about today's sponsor, Care Of. So if you haven't yet heard of Care Of, they are making vitamins more convenient and easier than ever. They're putting together personalized vitamin packs. This one is for me, it says Hi Kendall on it, and it has the exact vitamins that I need. You can customize them yourself, or you can take the quiz on their website and they will recommend vitamins for you if you're new to vitamins. You guys know it's almost Halloween. The seasons are changing so fast. As we move into those colder months, it's important to make sure your immune system is at its best and vitamins can really help you do that. An interesting fact, it takes an average of about 30 days for vitamins to really make a difference in your body and how you feel. So now is the perfect time before we head into winter. And then you can set up a subscription so that they're delivered automatically right to your door. It makes it so easy and convenient. Also, these little packs are made out of compostable materials and you can learn how to do it on their website. I'm gonna go ahead and take mine right now. I normally take mine at night, so it is that time. take vitamins like a champ. So check it out and take the quiz at the link below to see what vitamins and supplements that Care Of could recommend for you and get 50% off your first order with the promo code Kendall Ray. That's Kendall Ray for a whopping 50% off your first order. Be sure to use that code guys and get your vitamins in. That's it for me today, guys. Be sure to give this video a like, be sure to subscribe, leave me a comment, let me know what you think, and I will see you guys next Thursday for more Crime Tober.